Bless you. For those of you who weren't here last week, I, I'm going to give a little bit of an intro here. Last week we started a series in the book of Ephesians. It's called Sitcom Theology. I'm kind of tying in old, well maybe not so old, my age sitcoms with readings from Ephesians to talk about how we live our lives and how God has called us to be in the world. Um, last week was Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Um, for those of you that haven't noticed or actually want to see the clip that, that I talked about during my sermon, it is up on Facebook, on our on St. John's Facebook page. That clip is actually there. Um, today is about different strokes. How many remember this? So I'm going to give you a little bit of a synopsis here. Um, first and second episodes, I don't know what year this, this, this came out, like last year or last week, but Different Strokes is a show about a rich white man who had a black um, housekeeper and she passed away and on her deathbed she asked that he would take care of her two young boys. So he brought those two young boys into his house. So the first episode opens with Mr. Drummond bringing Arnold and Willis into his house and bringing them in as his children. And they, they don't want to be there because they remember their friends from home and they remember their, you know, the people they're around. But they don't have any family to take them in. So, and, and Philip Drummond told his housekeeper that on her, as she made that request on her deathbed, that he would take care of her children. So he said, I'm, I'm going to take care of, their, of these children. So he brings them in, the housekeeper, almost, the new housekeeper almost quits because she said, you told me you had one kid, now you're bringing in two more, I don't know if I can do this or not. We move to the second episode, which is the social worker now has to come in, right? Because this is kind of like an adoption situation and we have to make sure that this house is good for those kids, right? Though any of you who know or have been through the process, there's... There's a process to this of bringing children who are not your own into your household. And the, the state wants to make sure that your house is a good house for them. So the social worker comes in and is questioning the children. And, and after the children go back upstairs, she says, you know, Mr. Drummond, you did a great job of teaching those children exactly what they needed to say. You coached them very well. Because they acted really happy. And she was worried that these two little young black children would not be, these two young black boys would not be happy living with a rich white man. Because number one, they've always grown up in Harlem, so all they know is their, their community, right? They were surrounded by black people in Harlem of their same status, and now they're living in an upscale, top floor penthouse with a rich white man. And the social worker says to him, you know, black people should be with black families and white people should be with white families to which yeah exactly Clyde Clyde for those of you that can't see Clyde Clyde went like this <laughs> right we'll get to that in a moment so don't jump forward too fast <laughs> so the boys are upstairs and and Mr. Drummond is talking to his new housekeeper and and she's sweeping and, and he said to her, you know, that social worker said to me as she left the, the house that, that black children should be with black families and white children should be with white families. And she's sweeping and she can't hear him. So she says, what? And about that time, um, Arnold comes down the steps a little bit and he hears Mr. Drummond yell, black children should be with black families. How many of us have ever heard a snippet of a conversation and then think we knew what all of it was about? Remember, you're in church. <laughs> right? We do that all the time. You hear one little snippet of things and you don't get the whole story. So then they call the social worker back and the social worker brings in a black couple to come in and bring Arnold and Willis out of the, the house. But then at the end, it comes back around that um, Mr. Drummond Phillips sits down with the two boys at the end of the, the episode and says, you know, you, you misunderstood because that's what she said. And she said, well, I only said that because... My, uh, my computer told me to say that, and Mr. Drummond says to him, well, you need to tell your computer to go suck lemons. Because <laughs> it's not about white with whites or blacks with blacks. It's about love, right? 
It's about a peace and an understanding. It's about being united with something that's different than us. It's about being accepted for who we are and brought into the fold. And that fold not staying the same, but being changed because of us coming in, right? That's what it says in Ephesians. That's what it says right here this morning. Paul's prayer to these people. We talked a little bit last week about how Paul may not be the author of the book of Ephesians. And he may not be. But this is really truly what Paul's thoughts were and what Paul would have said anyhow. You know, Paul talks about us being accepted by because of what God did, not because of who we are. And just before our reading today in the book of Ephesians is one of the great verses that Lutherans are well known for knowing. Anybody know what it is? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Any confirmation to this? Know what it is? Where's my God? Where's Kurt? Where's my God's grace that you are saved through? For by grace you are saved through faith. Verse 9, not of your own work, so that no one may boast. Verse 10 is, for the works which I have prepared for you in advance. Right? That's, that's my paraphrase. The actual ones are. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he has prepared beforehand to be our way of life. So then remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth, those of you who are uncircumcised, right? Gentiles were not Jews, they were excluded from the promise. And Paul is talking to a group of Gentiles here, which is all of you. I could say all of us. That includes me. We're we're not Jews. At least I don't think anyone in this room was born a Jew. So we are the Gentiles, the uncircumcised. And Paul says that this is a physical thing. This is not what God has called us to look at. Because even you who were once separated, even you who were once apart from, even you who were the ones that were far away from the promise have been brought near. You were strangers and aliens, but now you are citizens with the saints. You are part of the included. You are part of the people that the promise is going to. It's exactly what he says here in this reading. It's not about the circumcision. It's about what Christ has done for all of us. But now Christ Jesus, who, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It doesn't matter your birthplace. It doesn't matter your birthright. It matters what Christ did for you. And because he's included you, you are part of of the chosen people. And then this next part is the, is the cool part. Why well, I did this little thing up here with the kids this morning. For he, meaning Jesus, is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one. And has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. What does that mean? What does Paul mean by that? For Christ Jesus is our peace. And in his flesh... He has broken down, he has made both groups into one. What are the two groups? Jews and Gentiles. And he's made them into one. He's taken what was separated and brought them together. He's taken what was opposed to each other, the broken down hostility, and taken down the wall and brought them together. He's abolished the wall with its commandments and ordinance that he might create in himself one new humanity, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross that put it to death that hostility through it. When we think about peace, we think about us having peace with God. We think about everything being beautiful in the world, right? And that everything, everybody's going to adhere to what God has to say, and everything's going to just follow along what God says. And that's really what Paul says here. But there's something that happens before we get to be at peace with God. And who are we at peace at? Each other. That's, that's what Paul says. What the author says here. 
For he is our peace, and he broke down the walls that he created, took down that barrier that was between the groups, and he, he is our peace. One other thing I saw for a children's sermon this week, I wasn't sure how many kids I was going to have, but this summer sometimes there's like two. So, But it talked about printing out letters on pieces of paper. I could have got a box of one to help with it too. But printing out letters on a piece of paper to spell out the word peace. You give them to each one of them, you stand them up, you get them in the right order so that it actually says peace, right? And then you ask one of the kids to leave the group. Does it say peace anymore? No. Because we can't have peace without that person being a part of this. We can't have peace without who being a part of it. Everyone. Because Jesus said everyone is so he came and proclaimed peace to those who were far off and peace to those who were near, who, those who were near. Because we all have access to the Spirit through him. Because we were all once strangers and aliens. But now through Jesus Christ we have been made citizens with the saints. We have been made part of the included group of the promise of God to be with him for all of eternity. That's a promise <coughs> that we can all hold on to. And that's a promise that we all need to go out and proclaim. As our prayer said this morning, right, the, the choice and the challenge or the, what was the, you think I would know that, right? Our prayer that we pray this morning, did any of you think about that? The prayer of the day, thank you for this day to rejoice and be glad in our calling to be ministers of hope and in our challenge to be minis missionaries of reconciliation. You are all ministers of God's hope in the world. Because everywhere you go, you show what Jesus has done for you, and thereby showing what Jesus can do for everyone around you. And you are a missionary of reconciliation, because you can help bring Jesus to those places and help them to see the peace that we have in Him. So through your presence and through your actions, you can be that person who brings reconciliation and helps to bring the peace that God said that is going to come into the world. Are you ready for your calling and your challenge? Because we said, help us bend to both call and challenge with our whole hearts. One household in spirit and body in Christ until all of the mountaintops in this world echo with peace and love. Are you ready for that calling? Are you ready for that challenge? I have, I have two things to say about that. And I'm saying this to all of us, so I'm saying this to myself. As much as I'm saying it to everyone sitting here. Our calling is ministers of hope, the missionaries of reconciliation. And my first thought is, I can't do that. I know who I am. And most of us could probably say the same thing if we're being truthful. We have issues at times seeing hope, and we have issues at times bringing reconciliation because we want our way. Okay? But through Jesus Christ, we can do everything because in Matthew, he told the disciples on the mountaintop, right, go and make disciples of who? All nations. Everyone. And this is the gospel that not long ago, right before this, when Jesus was talking, a Syrophoenician woman came to him and the disciples and asked that Jesus heal his, her daughter. And he said, it's not right to take the food from the table and give it to the dogs. He was talking about that woman. Because that was a term that Jews would have used for Gentiles. But she says, Lord, even the dogs get to eat the scraps from underneath the table. And he saw that she believed in the promises that he was bringing. So she was no longer a stranger or an alien. She was now a citizen with the saints. And Jesus said, your daughter has been. And then at the end, he says, go to everyone. 
because everyone needs to hear this. So can we do our calling as ministers of hope and missionaries of reconciliation on our own? No. But I know for a fact every one of you can do it because Jesus goes with you. And he not only goes with you to help you, he goes with you because he's the one that's sending you out there. So go into all the world, teaching them what God has taught us, helping them to see the love and the hope that they have in him, and helping that peace which God is going to bring between all of us to come to fruition so that all of us can be at peace with God. So include everyone, regardless of whether or not they look like they belong or you think they belong, because God has made them, and Jesus' grace covers them. So they are, with you, a citizen with the saints. Thank you.